I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the founder of the church I served as a bishop. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many others have made a similar journey into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about, people who want to share their story. So if you're a Latter-day Saint seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and again, I appreciate you joining with us. If you recall, last time we met Aaron Shafal-Wallaf, and uh, Aaron, I didn't ask you about your name. You say, say it, say it Shuffle for Wallaf. us. Shuffle? Shuffle Wallaf. Wallaf. It's not that tough, but you get a lot of funnies about, about Shop it. Shop at the mall, snuffle up, I guess. <laughs> Other unmentionables. Yeah, yeah Shafa <laughs> Wallop. But it's a, it's a terrific... And Ukrainian. Is it your your family who yes. emigrated? Or? Uh, my father's side. Yes. Father's side came, of course. I think my great-grandfather, yeah. Came over. And, yeah. Oh, that's terrific. Well, and as I mentioned, uh, Aaron's one of the handful, well, maybe not so handful, probably more than a dozen that I'm aware of, people who just have a heart for Mormons who never were Mormons. But as we learned last week... He uh, had a girlfriend and got him very close to Mormonism, took the lessons and uh, influenced him a little bit. And uh, anyway, so we're continuing on. And you were just telling us a, about mission trips with the C Campus Crusades for Christ. Well, my, my then girlfriend, yeah. not, not my now wife, no. was going to New Zealand for her summer your, mission trip. Your now wife. My now wife, okay. yes. Uh, right. Beautiful wife. She uh, was going and I thought, I would love to go on a mission trip this summer. And not through Crusade, but through Utah Partnerships for Christ with Russ East, who does the AIM 820 stuff. Right. Um, mm. Contacted him, and he had open positions for internships. So she goes to New Zealand, and you decide yeah. to come to Utah. Yeah. And how long was that? To... I think I was out here for seven weeks. Really? And when I arrived here, I quickly took to going downtown and doing street evangelism. Downtown here in Salt Lake? Because mm -hmm. he, he operates out of Ogden, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I had access to a car and went do different kinds of activities. Yeah. But once I got um, a taste of doing street evangelism, um, I loved it. I loved it. I didn't know what I was doing. made a ton of mistakes. You'd probably cringe if you saw a videotape or whatever. But, um, now, is this on a summer break from, the, from school? Then? Yes. Okay. During summer. Yeah. Now, you're, you're actually, maybe we bring this up now, but you're a computer programmer. Mm -hmm by trade, and so you've always been interested in computers and stuff, and so you went to school for that, and then you took this break to come out here and work seven weeks, I guess you said, for, mm -hmm. uh, for us. Or, so what happened going down to Temple Square? Um, I remember reading a lot of books to help prepare me to be a good, effective, useful, Felt like articulate. you needed to know Mormonism oh, even more. And it's good to do the homework, but I remember showing up and just fumbling my way and starting conversations with people. You know, brash, impetuous. I, I kind of miss my old self, too, because he's so brave. You just do it, you know. <laughs> Stop caring what people think. And I did it. God gave me the, the courage to do it. But uh, when it was time to open my mouth in conversation with people, a lot of the things I had studied just just fell away. It was just, my mind went blank. <laughs> and I remember uh, in these beginning conversations, the only thing that was at the tip of my tongue was I had been on the bus uh, up and down you know, Ogden, Salt Lake, I had been looking at Psalm 51, which is David's uh, prayer for forgiveness. He says, Have mercy on me, yeah. God, according to your unfailing love, blot out, according to your great compassion, blot out all my transgressions. Um, and I, I just, it just came out of my mouth. It was, it was what I had been thinking. You shared you know? this with people, that, and what did they say? I, mean, I, I, re I remember not even really uh, no, knowing where to take it. Yeah. And then, in Psalm 51, it says, deliver me from blood guilt. And this is David who had orchestrated the death of Uriah, Uriah and yeah. slept with Bathsheba. And uh, he cries out for forgiveness. And I remember asking, do you believe that David was forgiven? And what was their response? And his response was, no, it's not a forgivable sin. Yeah. And I just remember being shocked by that. And, <laughs> and, and so, well, this is, Psalm 51 is how we are saved. We have a simple cry out to God for mercy on the basis of God's goodness, of His great compassion, 
yeah, it, through the death, burial, and resurrection, the finished work of Christ and the goodness of God in the satisfaction of justice on the cross and um, God's offer of grace to us. And is, but the way, the way, the, the way that uh, Christians and believers speak is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And we trust Him for that. Yeah. And, and that, that developed. But I also remember just fumbling. I, I mean, just, <laughs> I was a mess. And I remember uh, meeting my friend Rob on the street. Rob Savolka. Rob Savolka. Yeah. Everybody knows him as a kind of John the Baptist guy. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't. I, when I met him, uh, he was just out doing conversational evangelism. Trying to. And at, did you watch what he was doing? At the South Gate, he was talking. It was two or three gals. Uh, and he um, was just having a really simple conversation with them and I was sort of standing off you know five ten feet and I was just watching and listening <laughs> and he had a very simple uh, he asked them questions and he shared the gospel with them and he prayed with them and he warned them and and he uh, gave them the Word of God and the conversation ended and <laughs> people left and I thought you can do that. Like I was just, I I'd all, read all these books. You but, wanted to baptize them right off, or well, something. <laughs> it's not that they were repenting, or that they were, were even favorably receiving the message as a yeah. believer, as believers, but it's that Rob had effectively done conversational evangelism to communicate, planting seeds, planting and, seeds, yeah. and clearly communicating the truth of God's word, and he had done it in a way that was, uh, I, was repeatable. And it was it was like a it was, it was like demystified to me. I saw oh I could do that I, I, and I just fell in love with it. I I, um, I just wanted to keep and coming back down. And and so you keep do doing that for the seven weeks and Russ was yeah. okay with that I guess. He, he kind of lost me. I, I'm joking, but you know he, that was my thing. I wanted to come. And so when I came back to Ohio, I thought I would love to move to Utah and do that kind of thing for the rest of my life. Really? And your wife came back from New Zealand or your. She wasn't your wife then. I guess she was just your girlfriend, or yeah. Was she? She wasn't your wife. No, when no, she no. Went to, okay, no. so she comes back, and then you guys get married. Yes. Yeah. Let me make a the story short. That was yes. a very quick short. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, it, and you tell her that of your experience in Utah, and I said, you know, if we get married, you probably probably part of the package will be us moving to Utah, and she. She's like, okay. She said, okay. Huh? Yeah. She's been my enabler in the sense that she helps, uh, she raises the kids and she, you know, makes so How many, many things. How many kids do you have? We've got three kids. We've got an only begotten son and two adopted princesses. Oh, how sweet. And she uh, frees me up in so many ways. Um, to be able to do this. To and go and preach and teach. And, well, that's neat. Yeah. Now, when you move here, you move to Orem, Utah, yeah. Utah County. You can't get much more Mormon than that. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> what put you down there? That's a little ways from, uh, from the town demographics. square. I, I looked at a chart and said, what's, the, you know, what's a good effective demographic of uh, high percentage? To? So we lived in a basement apartment. Well, my wife was pregnant. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it was, I, think I got a job down there doing um, computer programming. Yeah. And... Uh, I just remember thinking, I want to get closer to Temple Square, and I, I think we really were thirsty for a church, too, that um, we found a good church, Lifeline Community, up north, uh -huh. and we went there for seven years afterwards, but uh, we moved north, and it was, yeah. it, 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 but God was very good to us down, down in Orem. Now, you ran into a gentleman that uh, wanted to ask if you were a what, return missionary, or that you were a missionary? I was short-haired, and had a little baby boy with me. Um, a bit after moving there, and uh, where'd, you, where'd you go on your mission, kind of thing? I was at the park, <laughs> just pushing my son up on the swing, and the guy was like, "Hey, how are you?" And we we started a conversation, and he said, "So where'd you serve your mission?" And I yeah. said, "Well, actually, I am on my mission. I came here to Utah to talk to people like you." <laughs> and and uh, yeah, yeah. Did did were you able to talk to him or not? I don't even remember. Oh, okay. I don't want to sweeten the story more than I more than I should. So. So you started doing that, and, and I've got a whole list of little things that you've been involved in. And, um, I just wanted to make sure we get those covered. You uh, continue going to Temple Square. We've been doing it three seasons a year, almost every Thursday. Uh, sometimes weather happens or life happens, but 
um, it's been a good run. Well, I'm so, just curious now. Now you've had a little more maturity or time with this experience. What what seems to work when you're talking to people? I guess people are either coming out of the temple or they just sightseeing. Maybe they're even visiting Temple Square themselves. What what kind of works and what doesn't work? What our criteria find? for success on a given night is well, we, we start and we pray, God, please give each of us one good conversation before the night's over. Just even one. That's it. That's but that's enough, isn't it? I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. And then God usually lavishes us with two, three excellent conversations. I mean, we just, we, I think the, the thing that's made it so sweet to me is the community of believers. At times we have five or six different churches represented there of, you know, just normal how many, believers. How many go there? Or how uh, many on a low night, maybe four or five. On a higher night, maybe a dozen of believers. And they're not even evangelists. They're just believers. Just people that being, care about care, Mormons. Care and, and, uh, yeah, and it's a good cultural epicenter, too. About half the people we talk to these days are non-LDS people that are there for business conventions or skiing, oh. depending on the season. But, but yeah. they're there and they see the influence that, I mean, the church obviously tries to present a oh, very yeah. positive picture. They're trying to woo them into sure. the church. So you are you feel like you have good conversations with some of them, too? Yes. And I, I think the things that have stuck out to me or sort of emerged or evolved in my evangelism, uh, one is learning to share Jesus stories with people from really? the Gospels. And it's finding ways to make that suitable to the conversation and um, asking them lots of questions questions about their background and, and trying to find opportunities to share from the four Gospels. The other thing, too, is um, I, I'm, I'm someone who will go after Mormonism head on. You know, the, the scriptures are pretty direct in its rebuke of, of falsehood. But I often find that a lot of people I talk to, for them, Mormonism really isn't... I, I've known enough people in Utah to sort of figure out some diagnostics for are they already are they already on their way out? Really? So I like you know, Mormonism talks of gods in embryo. What I see in Utah is a lot of agnostics and atheists in embryo. So there's questions we can ask about people's worldview, and what we find is that um, Mormonism is a form of atheism. It's already primed people for if you define theism as the belief in a most high God who created everything. Mormonism isn't there. As soon as you start defining that with precision, Mormonism is not that kind of theism. And Mormonism has a kind of deep uh, suspicion about the preservation of the Bible. Sure. It treats faith as a very irrational uh, kind of thing. There's, it, there's no evidentiary aspect of yeah. it where it's encouraged by evidence. And uh, they have, have a hard time putting their head around grace and just some simple things. So a lot of times I meet people and I kind of circumvent Mormonism to talk about reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus that are independent of Mormonism. I like what you're saying because we we that are in this business, we know that there are a lot of Mormons who leave the church or when they leave the church, they become agnostic or atheist. Yeah, and I, I would I mean, want they don't to, all come to, to yeah. the, trust the Bible and trust Christianity, do they? No, when they become no. that. So what you're saying is true. They are embryo, uh, atheists in embryo, really. When people leave Mormonism and they, are, they remain very cynical about the God of the Bible, they haven't sufficiently yet left Mormonism. Mormonism has provided them with a kind of suspicion over God and the Bible and the nature of faith. And then when people leave Mormonism, uh, atheism is not across town. It's the, it's the house next door. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's a short transition. So I want to help LDS people see. Um, now, yeah. They wouldn't agree with that, though. No. I mean, a Mormon believes they're Christian, totally, and, and that they love Jesus and love God. What do we... My diagnostics are, yeah. if you weren't uh, a Mormon, hypothetically, what religion would you be? And I get teenagers to tell me, oh, I'd be a Buddhist. And I said, well, what about Jesus? And, oh. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, if you weren't a Mormon, do you think you could still trust the Bible? Or still, would you still believe, would you still have reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Boy, what kind of response do you get from that? I get that? a lot of no's that, you know, Mormonism and Joseph Smith are the only thing for them that would make 
Christianity work uh, in a sense of belief in Jesus or Scripture. And for other people, they say, well, of course I'd believe in Jesus. And, I, and then, so I just followed up by saying, well, what are some of the reasons you think there are to believe in Jesus that are independent of Mormonism? And usually for a Mormon, is so wrapped up in a testimony, um, it's very vulnerable. Because once that testimony is compromised by exposure to history and a number of other things, um, they have nothing left. So They don't have that foundation no. of Jesus, do they? The other thing is the words of Jesus. In the, in, the, in the four Gospels, Jesus says things like, My words are full of the Spirit and of life. And he says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Whoever builds his house on the rock, you know, who does it, hears and does the words I say, it's like he's building his house on a good foundation. Right. And he says at the end of the Gospel of Matthew to his disciples, Go, preach, teach, make disciples uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. And so when I ask LDS people, what did Jesus say about that? And broad topics, family, marriage, um, the cross, eternal life, authority, uh, the preservation of the kingdom, um, the nature of who Jesus is. And I, I, you know, I just like to ask people, what, what's your favorite of the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, or Luke, John. And they name one. I say, what, what's your favorite teachings of, those, of that Gospel? And it... And it quickly becomes a, oh, I haven't read it in a long yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not a scriptorian. And I said, yeah. well, would you mind if I just shared a few stories from the Gospel of Matthew with you? Jesus actually addressed that quite a bit. Uh, fa for example, uh, family and marriage. And you know, Jesus teaches that uh, marriage doesn't persist into the resurrection. And he teaches in Matthew, that was in 20, Matthew 22, and he teaches in Matthew 19 uh, that... It, Divorce is pretty severe because we're not allowed to separate what God has joined together. And then the disciples are like, well, it's better not to get married then. And Jesus' response is basically to lift up the, the eunuch as um, even a better way of doing kingdom life. Yeah. He lifts the, the celibate single person up as a model of kingdom life. Jesus honors that as a completely legitimate way to live as a citizen of the kingdom. And then Jesus tells elsewhere, if you want to be his disciple, you've got to hate your father, mother, uh, children in the sense that you've got to love him more than any of that. And then when his mom is looking for him, they, they send for Jesus and they can't get inside the house because he's Justin Bieber popular and they can't get inside. And they say to Jesus, your mom, and you think your brothers are looking for you. And Jesus says, anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my, is my family member. It's a new family dynamic. Yeah. So Jesus teaches us a new family dynamic with a unity based on doing the will of the father. He teaches we've got to be willing to give up our family. He teaches that it's better to be a celibate single eunuch, uh, or at least honors that up as a preferable way of kingdom life. And he teaches there's, there's no resurrection. There's no, uh, oh, excuse me, there's no <laughs> marriage at the resurrection. And he says to these people, you don't know the power of God or scriptures. We, we haven't yet really uh, internalized the incredible resurrection power of God and his promises to give us an afterlife. Uh, a, a resurrection life such that we have everything we need to be happy in a community and in relationships. We, we haven't trusted, we say, oh God, I'm really insecure about me being happy in the afterlife, so I need to project what I have here onto that. And Jesus says, you don't know the power of God or the scriptures. You haven't really let this settle down. Now, will, so. a, will a Mormon actually listen to this conversation? Have you had some that, I guess, some that will? I've had a lot of success with it because I can... And I'm talking one way with you, but with my LDS conversation partners, I can offer to share a Jesus story. Yeah. And there's usually a little bit of familiarity with some of the stories, <laughs> and I can step through the Jesus stories. And what I love to do is share four or five really? things he did, yeah. things he said, and then wrap it up with a summary of what we just covered. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for them to say, you hate us, you're anti-Mormon, you're just bashing our church. I'm just trying to give you Jesus. So you're not necessarily giving them what we'd call the bad news, the B Book of Abraham problems and the first vision problems and Book of Mormon problems. I would appropriate problems, to the conversation and the person. If it is. Yeah. But that's not your initial. Do you find Mormons don't know very much about their own church and about their own history? I, I always feel like it was rather shallow knowledge that they have. Yeah, 
I, I, I think uh, they don't know half of it. Um, and in fact, they get a superficial exposure to Joseph Smith's polygamy, for example. And they say, yeah. I already know about that. Yeah. And you follow up with, well, do you know about polyandry? And they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, if you, if you, you don't know what polyandry is yet, you haven't spent 10 minutes on the issue. You haven't really studied it. And, and then, yeah. and you've also, you were also saying that uh, even LDS don't always believe what LDS oh, people have said. I mean, you run into that a lot, I'm sure. There are 14 million different denominations of Mormonism. <laughs> One Each for member. every individual. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, some people believe in Heavenly Mother, some people don't. Some people believe God the Father was once a mortal sinner before he became a God, some don't. Some have different ideas of what it means to become a full-blown God, worshipped by your own spirit children someday. Some kind of try to back off of that. Some people think that our Father in Heaven is the first of all the gods and that Smith and subsequent prophets were just speaking irresponsibly when they taught of Heaven the Grandfather and the ancestry of the gods above our God. We are kind of left. We, as Mormons, were very much left to our own imagination and conclusions with some of it. Some of the brethren have talked about stuff that we should be more aware of and maybe define things more clearly like you're talking mm -hmm. about, but a lot of that stuff is, is kind of up for us to decide how, who's God yeah. and, and where he fits in and where Jesus fits in. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets and false teachers. You'll yeah. know them by their fruits and you won't go to where the thorns and thistles are to get figs and grapes. And it seems interesting to me that Jesus prepares us to identify false teachers by how the adherents of the false teachers already treat them. So for Mormons, it's not that I really have to convince them really hard that Brigham Young and Bruce McConkie are false teachers. They already treat Bruce McConkie like, like the crazy old uncle in the yeah. attic who ought not be consulted on matters of doctrine. Even and though. they already treat Brigham Young as a very crazy other uncle in the attic who you don't want talking. He has thorns and thistles. You don't go for him for grapes and figs, except for maybe a few choice quotes. They already te treat their own leadership as fallen prophets. It is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we, we dismiss some of them. Well, a couple of other things before we get, we're running out of time again. Um, you've written, you've participated in a book recently. It's called Sharing the good news with Mormons. Mm -hmm. And you wrote a chapter in that. Tell us about that a little bit. It's about keeping it simple. I really wanted to empower people who um, don't have a lot of time or in their life circumstance, it doesn't make sense for them to do a deep dive in Mormonism. I really want them to focus on asking questions to start conversations, getting their background of the conversation partner, of spending time on clearing up misconceptions that Mormons have about the Christian faith. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Like a lot of Mormons think the Trinity is modalism. Well, yeah, they, yeah they don't understand. And there's a lot of Jesus stories that we have at our disposal. Uh, there's a lot of material in the four Gospels that we can use to share the Gospel with Mormons. So I try to keep it really simple such that someone could read the chapter and an hour later take three things from it and, and immediately use it. Yeah. I'm not trying to impress them with a kind of idiosyncratic view of the particularities of Mormonism. I'm, I'm really trying to help them feel empowered to immediately go and communicate yeah. as an ambassador of Jesus. You're telling them that they don't need tons of knowledge to, to be able to share the, the good news. They, they need none to start. And they would be it would be responsible for them to grow in that. To learn, yeah. In that, but they can start now. They don't need yeah. to be studious yeah. at the beginning. Okay. Uh, they need to hit the ground running. Well, yeah. another thing you do is it's called Aaron Schaff. Oh. Dot WordPress dot com. The blog, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, you write some very interesting things. I think one of the first one of the first things I read from there was about the ten, ten different. Uh, uh, Reasons sure. Jesus Ten wasn't. benefits of restating oh. someone's oh, position. Oh. Remember that one? Yeah. And what was the other one you were going to mention? Oh, a I, I, recent one was ten reasons why Jesus' wedding in John 2 at Cana. Or, no, sorry. Wasn't the his. wedding at Cana wasn't Jesus' wedding. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, seeing that. And harmony of the resurrection, the yeah. accounts of the resurrection. And, again, getting Mormons to really consider the Bible. And I think that is a great approach rather than what we call the bad news, to really hit them with the good news. And this, yeah, we have a responsibility means. to expose the bad of Mormonism. Yeah. And to, uh, there's but a, that can come. It can, and, yeah. and, and I don't want to back away from that. Paul uses kind of holy war language when he talks about 
um, taking the things that have set themselves up against the knowledge of God and then tearing them down in humility and gentleness. But he wants to take the false claims against the glory of God and the truth of Jesus. And he wants to tear them down to the glory of Jesus. But um, I think we got to keep perspective here is that uh, Mormonism is circling the drain. And a lot of people who leave Mormonism, um, I'll put it this way. I think it's really important for people to get a clear view of false religion as boring. Um, Jesus has all the riches of knowledge. He has all the treasures of everything good, Colossians teaches. And any other religion that says, well, we have a greater mystery or a set of knowledge or fa things that are fascinating, the Bible says that's boring. So Mormonism is interesting to me insofar as I can use it as an opportunity to share about the truth of who Jesus is. But in the end, it's terribly boring. It's just another, it's just a modern instantiation <laughs> of ancient uh, polytheism and fleshly passions that, you know, itching ears want scratched. It, it, it suits uh, the flesh, but it's not, in the end, Mormonism will be dead and forgotten. It'll be like, uh, uh, it'll be like first century Roman worship of the various deities that yeah. we don't even know about anymore. It's going to end up just like That's your, Zoa Zoroastrianism. That's your prophetic uh, sense of things. <laughs> we have a Christ that makes Mormonism look boring. We have a God that makes the God of Mormonism look uh, weak and unsatisfying. We have a truth that provides a foundation and a fuel for an emotional life and an emotional worship that makes the emotions and the romanticism of Mormonism look terribly dead and boring. But you, unless you get people to be willing to look at that bigger perspective, they're very so narrowly focused that they just won't open their eyes and see that. So until they see gentle seeds, <laughs> gentle seeds. Well, gosh, you've learned so much uh, about Mormon. You know a lot more about Mormonism now, I guess, than uh, you ever thought you would. <laughs> yeah, and I hope to use that as a, as a service and a gift to the church oh. to help engage it. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. I appreciate your willingness to share with with. Thank I you. mean, these are my people. I love them, and I love the community and my family. And I've Amen. lost I've lost friends and family because of the journey I'm on, and I. And most of it's because they're unwilling to look, mm. you know, and when you do bring up something, they just back away. They don't yeah. have any trust of the Bible or Christianity and aren't willing. So, Aaron, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time and all you do. So thank you. we'll see you next time here on the Ex-Mormon Files.